Welcome. John Williams. Hello, folks. Welcome to another look at uh, The Phantom Menace. Um, so this week, we're looking at the gas leak um, score reduction, 1M4. Um, and I, I love the fact that the Emperor's theme makes an appearance at this juncture. Um, it's it's an interesting one. There's there's a YouTube um, clip um, of John Williams talking about the Emperor's theme, and he, yeah, you know, I think he describes it as sort of kind of nasty, um, which I quite like. That's very funny for me. And um, it is a very very simple motive. It's just I guessed. Uh, just a few notes. Like that. Um, I'm just going to turn this up a little bit, just my own sake, I think. Um, and there's a sort of weird hint, a sort of cultural hint of... <laughs> um, of that going on as well um, in these notes here. Um, it's just sort of flipped around a little bit. Um, and it's all triadic as well. Um, so the first bar here, interestingly enough, the harmony is um, sort of augmented. It's, it's elongated um, in two bars um, so that you really do have, at least in this instance, G minor. Uh, to B flat minor. Um, and it's the opposite direction of Darth Vader's theme. Um, actually goes the, the direct inversion um, of it. So it goes up a minor third to B flat major and then back down to G minor as well. There's obviously something in that that Williams thought would be interesting um, when he was composing it for the first time, obviously in Return of the Jedi. I think I've put a, a clip here 38 minutes 17 seconds um the emperor is not as forgiving as i am <laughs> sort of thing that sort of like ominous oh my word <laughs> um so um there's some also really interesting bits of orchestration here because um what's happening is that the everything is so low um so we've got bass drum tam tam all the way in the background, this sort of low rumble, which you don't really hear, sadly, on the on the, the final version of the film. But it is there in the audio, definitely. Then we've got um, male voices or men's voices and um, a synth also doing the same sort of thing as well, which is doing this main theme um, on this uh, level here. Um, and then we've got um, quite sort of heavy woodwind and everything else. Um, which is all here. Um, so um, that is going on in the background. They're playing all the harmonic um, stuff here, uh, the harmonic um, fluff, I guess you could call it. It's not really fluff. It's essential material, but there we go. Um, trombones are then just interjecting a little bit um, as the music goes along um, with these sort of little fanfare-like things, but incredibly low. Um, and very dark, therefore, but they're just treated well because I think partly because they're muted means they have a slightly brighter sound um, and so they stand out a little bit more. Um, we then have, um, as it turns into um, C-sharp minor, um, as well, notice the spacing, obviously, in, in the very low notes. There's nothing sort of clogging this area here. Again, it's very good um, orchestration. Um, so Neufeld uh, and Pope, Conrad Pope, um, who did this one. Um, and um, yeah, there's nothing sort of really getting in the way um, of what's going on. It's interesting. Um, some people sort of go B flat, made, uh, B flat minor with an F in the bass. It is actually with a B flat in the bass. That's the lowest sounding note uh, on the contrabassoon. And I think the tuba as well, certainly the double bass is. Um, so uh, yeah. That is that. Um, then we have these parallel chords. Um, and again, it's repeated. But this time it's segmented and slightly shortened. Um, so we have the first bar here in this part here. And then just the last few notes of bars three in the first 
two beats of bar four sort of just next to each other um and slightly shortened i love the sort of gliss cellos which would be quite hard to do i'd have thought <laughs> especially going from there uh, back down to there um and then back to the i guess the first finger on the g string um anyway but that keeps going and it actually then changes key really um he prepares for it uh, like that but it's interesting that it's tempered somewhat um we've got a d in the bass but in terms of the the inversion it's just um a direct transposition of that um it's just in d not g um so the dominant of it just a little development I love the fact that it still works, though, um, going back to C-sharp minor and C-minor from D instead of G. Very, very cleverly constructed. And um, it does sort of bring to mind one of the things that William says, which is, you know, I'll, I'll go away and have a look at what I've done or listen to what I've done. Um, and then if he doesn't like something, he'll just rewrite it. Um, you know, we've all had that, I'm sure. Um, so a really wonderful um, example of that. So um, we've then got um, D minor again, uh, which is, the, I guess, you know, one of the sort of main ways of introducing a key, which is to introduce it and then you come back to it at the end, it's trying to cadence in it. I mean, he does cadence in it. It's just an unusual cadence. It's not a perfect cadence, that's for sure. Uh, but it's sort of a cadence. Um, and then um, he manages to then get to F, which is another upper minor third. So there are all these tertiary chord relations, which, again, we've seen so many times before. Um, yes, so um, one of the things here is in this chord cluster here. Um... where we have two major chords, C major and D flat major, but played together. Um, and suddenly with an F in the bass, it sort of really makes sense um, with that. Um, and I've just put it, it's a harmonic minor. Um, but it's lovely when it's telescoped. Yes, so the, I put NB how trumpet misses out G. So note how we don't have a um, a semitone at the top of the chord. Often he's very, very careful to do that. We, we have got the G here. Um, so it does make, um, you know, definitely a, a minor second, but it's on a different instrument. This is all wind at this point um, and strings as well. Um, so he's quite careful to do that. It's a sort of uh, traditional jazz voicing uh, where, you know, you would tend to miss out, you know, uh, the next available note because otherwise it's just going to sound like a wrong note in the uh, in whatever the, the first voice is. So the second voice is placed a little bit lower, at least a tone. Um, and then we have this but a little up um, little figure on the violins. Um with another Sforzando here. Um, so a lot of this is um, is this really lovely sort of double harmonic minor scale um, as well. So um, one of these sort of, whenever I um, analyze these things, I often just go onto the internet and find out, has somebody analyzed that already? Um, and then often they have, um, and, uh, you know, they call it the double harmonic minor scale. It's, um, I guess, um, I think that it's also called the Hungarian scale as well. Sometimes you can start with the tone. Sometimes you can start with the semitone as well. Uh, there's a lovely um, nuance to it. Um, and then we've got this absolute sort of mayhem of clusters. <laughs> Um, the harp gliss, I think, gives it away a little bit easier. Um, 
um, again, this sort of slightly augmented um, idea um, with extremely discordant um, basses and cellos. Doing this an octave higher, which is very sort of modern jazz, I think, isn't it? Um, and then we end up here. Um, again on an F. E. Sorry. <laughs> um, which I think is part of an octatonic set as well. Um, so, at this point, where the solo clarinet comes in, and this wonderful um, solo line that sort of creeps through the orchestration. Um, I love it. I think it works incredibly well. It's part of this sort of minor third idea, which derives, I guess, ultimately from the very, very first um, idea there. Bum, 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 bum. Um, and also from before. Uh, so anything... Anything like that, anything sort of chromatic is going to be pretty much related to the to the um, initial set. Um, by the way, all of this pitch class set things, you can just find um, even simply on Wikipedia. But there is a lovely book by David Cope. I think I've mentioned this in a previous video, um, which lists all of the pitch class sets and explains what they are. Basically, it's just a numerical system for identifying certain pitches and intervals so that you can transpose those intervals, but the interval class will remain the same. In other words, the quality of how many minor seconds are there in this scale. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, how many major seconds, how many minor thirds, how many major thirds. You get this thing called an interval vector, which tells you how many of those intervals there are. Um, it was just a way of identifying music which didn't um, have um, scope for traditional um, harmonic analysis. And I am focusing a lot on harmony at the moment. Um, just because it's something that really interests me. And also, I think it's one of the things that, um, certainly from students I've taught in the past, um, is uh, often a bit of a stumbling block, because harmony teaching um, tends to sort of just die off after about the classical period, and nobody really studies sort of romantic harmony and modern things. Um, so sometimes it's to be very much encouraged. Um, then we've got... Um, I love this sort of wide vibrato that distorts the notes. So even it, it's already low, sort of E territory, but you don't really hear it because everything's going whoa, 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 sort of wobbly and very, very wide. Then we've got these dark drums coming in. Um, I guess sort of G minor. Both chords, really. There we go. Edit mode again. Oh, honestly. Um, that's... The same as that it's just verticalized um i did that the wrong way around verticalized there we go that's better um and um we have this lovely um chord here uh, which is still part of the double harmonic minor And again, these horns, which seem slightly delayed on the recording, just because there's so many of them, wah, 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 sort of very pesante, very heavy horns. Um, um, and then just a direct sequence of this, uh, just transposed up. Um, but again, all triadic as well, above the G minor. Um, and then G continues uh, with timpani rolls and um, other ideas. Um, with trills um, on the strings as well, violins, um, which, uh, again, they're all part of the, the double harmonic minor scale. In a sense, it doesn't really matter what, what chords. You could do any chords. They all work, literally. Any chord would work over over that bass. Um, so same same cell as the clarinet, but augmented and harmonised. Uh, again, 
Um, from here. A little bit. It should be a D flat, really. It's so close, though, isn't it? Um, and then we've got other ones as well. A another cell. I guess you could say that that is related to all of them. But you can see how it starts off. You know, anything with a third in it and then a semitone is going to work. Um, then we've got uh, another... Um, feels like a suspended chord here, so I don't, I don't think I even gave it a name. Um, but we've got... I think it felt like a suspended chord because of the C there. If it was just a B... You want it to go to B. Which it does, but it doesn't really hear. It just remains suspended um, throughout much of it. Um, then we got this F minor 6, 9 over G. <laughs> sort of ridiculous. Um, and again, it feels suspended. Um, and that's where we leave it, um, because it goes straight into the next cue. Um, oh, and then I've lost my sound. Um, with another C harmonic minor scale verticalized. So I just went... Where's the F gone? It's there. <laughs> Somewhere else. Where's B? There we go. No. Where is it? Ah! Oh, I thought I had it. Maybe there's there's no B. Um, okay, fair enough. I'm sure there was B later on, but I think I've missed it out. Um... Anyway, if there's not, it's still vaguely C, C harmonic minor. Just without the leading note. Um, so, um, you might sort of ask, well, why did he leave it out? I think the B clashes or... I mean, it's crazy to say it clashes too much when you've got a massive chord cluster going on. But it does really. But it's because of the the C and it's having the C and the B and the A flat. That's all okay because there are no sort of. I mean, there's a semitone here, but because it's not, because um, it's tempered slightly with these notes. If it was that, it would be partial, and it really plays an extension. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting one. One that I can't really explain easily. Why is there no B? Maybe it's just muddy? I think that just feels to me, without the B, a little bit more suspended, expectant. Da, 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 da. Actually, in the interestingly enough, they put an extra chord in on the film version and... Um, of the score, so it must have been put in by the music editor, um, because in this bit there are only one, two, three, four chords before the semiquaver, um, and then you've got this amazing fourth with a cluster. Um, and then this bit here actually reappears much later in the film. Like that. Uh, C sus4 with a flat 9, I've called it. Um, so that's not actually in the film at all. It's a lovely little vignette of the Emperor's theme, what you can do with it, and then a little bit of action as well um, in terms of what, you know, expectant action. Um, all of this bit here, and then we've got some synth parts that's just sort of segue into the next cue, which I'm doing next week. Um, so it's a really fascinating little cue, actually. Um, and it's amazing what you can do with three notes. <laughs> it's, it's lovely. I mean, it's just, it's so dark. 
um, and eerie. And of course, um, you know, the emperor's like an old witch, really, isn't he? <laughs> sort of cackling away um, in the background, the phantom menace that's uh, behind everything. And all the Jedi's minds are closed. They're clouded. They don't know what's going on. Um, but already um, the uh, leaders of the separatist movement are completely ensnared by him. Um, so, yeah, so whenever you see things like 722, it just refers to a set of seven notes, and it's whatever Forte or Alan Fort decided was the 22nd version of a set of, second, of seven notes there are in it. And then you can go to it, um, the, the, um, the list of pitch class sets, and discover uh, what they are. In fact, I might even be able to just uh, do that now, because um, this is where I get a little bit of information. Uh, sometimes they are accurate and sometimes they're not. Um, so you've got to be a little bit careful. Um, so anyway, I'll go to the set calculator, which is on this website here, which is really useful. Um, and then pitch class set list. So list of set classes. Ah, oh, I was hoping that I would find the Wikipedia version of it. Oh, here we go. I have got it. Um, it just suddenly got away from me. So I'm trying to do this live, as it were. Um, so it's an ordered collection of uh, tones. Um, so, yeah, uh, what was this one? 722. So if I try and find that, um, here we go. Double harmonic minor scale. So they give them a prime form here, and then it tells you how many um, intervals there are. So four minor seconds two major seconds, four minor thirds, five major thirds, four um, uh, perfect fourths, and two augmented fourths. Everything else is an, uh, is an inversion of that. So that's the only intervals that exist. Um, and where it says 0125689, that refers to the actual um, letter name note, zero being C. So one is C sharp or D flat, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, but of course you can start on any note and it will still work. So when you click on this, obviously there seems to be a semitone in the way here. Um, but um, you can sort of tell that if you go to this, um, we've got another one which is exactly the same set and actually starts with a tone. Uh, it's another one. All sorts of different things. So there are all sorts of different scales that he tends to use um, in Phantom Menace. And they're all very exotic, um, but they're, no, they're not invented necessarily. They're just used in a, in a rather specific way. Um, so either sort of quite diminished or quite augmented. <laughs> um, and it's a real hodgepodge of different uh, musical traditions, really. We've got, you know, all this sort of triadic stuff. Um, that going on, which is definitely something that tends to appear in Phantom Menace a lot, but very differently from the original Star Wars film, which is... That sort of idea is sort of very major. Um, this is much darker and also again feels more statuesque very much like the sort of Corinthian columns that you get in all of the architecture in this old Republic era everything is is clean and pristine very very different um, to what the original films were uh, where you've got sort of dirt and grime and everything else um, so yeah next week we're going to look at the first bit of the droid battle um, which is an extraordinary piece of work and it took me absolutely ages just to copy out not even do the analysis of it um, so anyway I hope you've enjoyed um, this episode and um, yeah next week we'll move on to M uh, one M5A I think it's called um, which is the droid battle um, so uh, yeah stay safe and I'll see you next time goodbye